let's take a look at nuclear scattering experiments. And we'll start out with the original one, the Rutherford experiment, also called Geiger-Marsden experiment, also called the gold foil experiment. And remember, here we have a very thin sheet of gold foil, just a few gold atoms thick, and we're going to launch alpha particles at it. And these alpha particles, remember, have two protons and two neutrons. They have positive charge. And this is called a scattering experiment because we're going to observe how the alpha particles scatter after they interact with the gold. And what's observed is that most of the alpha particles simply pass through. They are not deflected, not changed by interacting with the gold atoms and the gold foil. A few of the alpha particles are deflected a small angle, or maybe even a larger angle. And rarely, but notably, some of the alpha particles actually bounce back off of the gold atoms. The conclusions that were reached by Rutherford, Geiger, and Marsden after observing this is that the atoms are mostly empty. And they came to that conclusion because most of the alpha particles just go, go through the gold atoms. They go through the gold foil unaffected, so it's mostly empty space. But some of those alpha particles bounced back, and some were deflected. So that suggested to them that there is a very small, but relatively massive and positively charged center to the atom. Had to be small because most of the alpha particles simply passed through. Only a few of them were deflected or bounced back. Had to be massive because it has to be massive for the alpha particles to bounce off of it. And it had to be positively charged so that it would repel the positively charged alpha particles. And this is where the idea of the nucleus came from. The nucleus fit the description of a small, relatively massive, and positively charged center to the atom. And we're going to take a closer look at this kind of situation. Let's imagine that we have one single alpha particle moving in toward a gold nucleus. And let's imagine that alpha particle is right on target for the center of the gold nucleus. Now that alpha particle is going to come in, and it has some kind of kinetic energy, and it's going to be able to reach some distance from the gold nucleus before the Coulomb force causes it to accelerate and stop. So there's going to be a moment of closest approach, the closest that the alpha particle can get. And I'm going to imagine what's going on there. That's going to be the moment that we think about. So right at that moment, let's imagine, how close can that alpha particle get? Well, let's say that the alpha particle starts with a kinetic energy given by E alpha. So that's the amount of kinetic energy the alpha has to begin with. Well, at closest approach, that alpha particle is no longer moving. All of the kinetic energy has been turned into potential energy. And in fact, it's been turned into electric potential energy. And electric potential energy is given by this equation. EPE is equal to KQQ over R. So for this particular situation, let's see, we have K, that's a constant. One of the charges is the charge on the alpha particle, which is 2E. The other charge is the charge of the gold nucleus, and I'm going to call that Z times E, where Z is the number of protons in the gold nucleus. And then we divide by R, which is the distance between the nucleus and the alpha particle. So that's going to be the closest distance that they get. I'm going to call that RC, closest distance. Now, because the kinetic energy of the alpha particle transformed into the electric potential energy, we can write this down. E alpha, the original kinetic energy of the alpha particle, has to equal the potential energy when they have closest approach. Okay, so now if we solve this for RC, for that closest distance that they get, we get this expression. RC is equal to K times 2E times ZE over E alpha. And if we know the value of k, and we do, it's a constant, and if we know the value of e, and we do, that's a constant, and we know, if we know the value of z, and we do, we know how many protons are in a gold nucleus, um, and if we also know the kinetic energy that the alpha particle had at the beginning, then we can find rc. Now, why would you find rc? Who really cares about that? Well, you're finding rc because then you have an upper limit on the size of the nucleus. You know that the nucleus has to be smaller than Rc. And 
you know that it has to be smaller than RC because if the nucleus was bigger than that, then the alpha particle would have been inside of the nucleus, and then it wouldn't have bounced back. The alpha particle would have been inside of a nucleus, and other things would have happened. So this allows us to estimate the size of a nucleus by probing it with other particles, the alpha particles. In some ways, this was the start of particle physics experiments, and this was the first kind of scattering experiment of its kind. And if you do these experiments with alpha particles and gold nuclei and other nuclei, what you'll find is that the radius of the nucleus is given by r0 a to the one third. Here, r0 is called the Fermi radius, and it's a constant that is found by experiment, found by observation. The Fermi radius is equal to 1.2 times 10 to the minus 15 meters. Very, very small. A is the number of nucleons in the nucleus. So we have an expression for the radius of a nucleus given by a constant and then the number of nucleons contained in it. Using this, we can determine the density of the nucleus because we know that the nucleus is small and relatively massive, but let's try to figure out just exactly how dense it is. If it's small and it's massive, it should be pretty dense. Let's try to figure out how dense. Well, let's assume that the nucleus is a sphere. That's the simplest possible uh, assumption we can make. Uh, and if we do that, then its volume is given by 4 thirds pi r cubed. Well, if we find its density, density is mass over volume. Okay, well, the mass of the nucleus would be the number of nucleons times u. Now that's an approximation. Because really, what we should do to find the exact mass of a nucleus is we should add up the number of protons and all the masses of the protons, the number of neutrons, and all the masses of the neutrons. We also have to worry about the mass defect and the details like that. But let's leave it with an approximation. Approximately every proton and neutron has a mass of about 1u, one unified atomic mass unit. So approximately the mass of a nucleus is the number of nucleons times a u. All right, we divide by the volume, which is 4 thirds pi r cubed, and we're left with this expression. Density is equal to 3au over 4 pi r cubed. Okay, well that r, that's the radius of the sphere, the radius of the nucleus. If we use the expression that the radius of the nucleus is r0, a to the 1 third, then we can get the density is 3au divided by 4 pi times that expression cubed. Okay, well that leaves us with 3au divided by 4 pi Fermi radius cubed times a. a's cancel out, so the number of nucleons cancels out, and we're left with 3u over 4 pi Fermi radius cubed. That is a constant. The density of the nucleus is approximately constant, no matter how many nucleons you have inside of your nucleus. So, if you figure out the value, of this density of nuclei. It's equal to 2.3 times 10 to the 17 kilograms per cubic meter. That is very, very large. That is an enormous density. Um, that is not something that we would encounter in everyday life. That is a very, very large dense density. So nuclei are incredibly dense compared to our normal conception of matter. Now, let's think about what would happen if we did the Rutherford experiment with higher energy alphas. If the alpha particles aimed at the nucleus have a very high energy, then they'll get very close to that nucleus. And if the alpha particle gets close enough, then the Coulomb force isn't going to be the only force that's important anymore. If they're able to get very close to the nucleons in the nucleus, the strong force starts to be important. Remember, the strong force is a force between nucleons that are very close together. So if that alpha particle can get close enough to those nucleons in the nucleus, the strong force starts to be influential, and the alpha particles will not act like they did at low energies, because before, we were only worrying about the Coulomb force. Now we have to worry about the strong force. 
So when that happens, the alpha particle will not deflect like it did before, because now there's these strong force interactions to worry about. So that becomes a problem. You can't use very high alpha particle energies to probe the nucleus, because then the alpha particle gets incorporated, becomes involved in the strong force inside the nucleus. So what would happen if we used electrons? Let's use electrons to probe the nucleus. This is called electron scattering. And the reason we might do this is electrons don't experience the strong force. So if you send electrons in toward the nucleus, they won't experience that strong force interference like the alphas did. And if you do this, if you send these electrons in um, toward the nucleus, it turns out they diffract around the target. They diffract around the nucleus. Because remember, electrons have an associated wavelength, the de Broglie wavelength. So just as water waves will diffract around an obstacle, electrons sent in toward the nucleus will diffract around the nucleus. This is a strange idea to think about because we think about electrons, even though we maybe shouldn't, we think about electrons as being like little bullets. But they're bullets that also have associated wave behavior. And it turns out that if you do this, and you look at the electron intensity versus the angle of deflection, you get a pattern like this. And this pattern is similar to what you would get in single slit diffraction but now it's actually single obstacle diffraction. It's actually kind of the inverse or the opposite of single slit diffraction. But it has some behavior that's similar to single slit diffraction. And this minimum right here, this minimum in the electron intensity, that appears where the sine of the angle of deflection is equal to lambda over d, where lambda is the de Broglie wavelength of the incoming electrons, and d is the diameter of the obstacle. In other words, the diameter of the nucleus in this experiment. So with this graph, we're able to estimate the diameter of a nucleus using these incoming electrons. Now if you use even higher energy electrons, and they just have to have very high energy, if you do that, the electrons have very, very small de Broglie wavelengths and they begin to interact not just with the nucleus, they don't just diffract around the nucleus itself. Now these wavelengths are small enough that the electrons begin to interact with individual nucleons inside the nucleus. And in fact, if you go up to high enough energies of the electrons, the electrons will scatter off the quarks that are inside the nucleons, which are inside the nucleus. And this is one of the ways we get observational evidence of the existence of quarks.